Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm really uh, quite excited again to uh, see you. This week it has been a little bit uh, difficult week, but uh, everything is alright now. Uh, for some people who don't know me or they joined us for the first time, I am uh, Dr. Alkamas. I'm Professor Emeritus with the Ohio State University. I'm a transplant surgeon by uh, training and practice. And today, uh, the topic is transplantation. Uh, it's going to be covered uh, over several, uh, several uh, mini talks. I believe in the short uh, mini talks or mini lectures or short messages anywhere around eight to about 15 minutes. So I'll try to do my best. Uh, sometimes I went up to 20 minutes. Today, I'll try to stay within the 15 minutes and uh, we'll handle a different uh, topic of uh, transplantation. So each episode is, uh, you will learn a different uh, message and different uh, piece of uh, information related to transplant. So what is the audience for this mini talk? It's really directed toward medical students, but uh, probably nursing students could benefit for it, uh, from it, a general practitioner could benefit from it, junior doctors and so on. Uh, so it's uh, very simple. And uh, I'll try to repeat this uh, slide with uh, every uh, talk, so the message uh, become uh, quite uh, clear. As we know, transplantation doesn't really happen just like that. It requires a lot of uh, preparation, and uh, it is a multidisciplinary uh, uh, approach. This is uh, probably the classic example of a multidisciplinary approach, the specialty itself faces it on you. So you do need a hospital. A hospital that is not really special hospital. That's the wrong message at all. The correct message is a department within a, within a hospital because you will need so many other specialties help if you want to have a very successful program. So a transplantation hospital alone, I'm against it, and I don't think it's really uh, a, a good setup for a successful transplant program. So the hospital will have the facility where you will admit the patients for uh, uh, transplant and for workup, and when they get sick after the transplant and so on, they will have the operation rooms uh, that uh, are equipped or well equipped and they have the staff that's properly trained the the hospital will have the ICU will have a good radiology department where you will need the imaging for the workup of the transplant and the reading of the anatomy as well as post transplant imaging as well as intervention so we do need their help with the intervention in some of the transplant complications such as ureteric uh, stenosis or biliary duct stenosis or leaks and so on. Surgery, yes, you do need, I mean, certainly you need the skills of uh, surgery. So you need a surgeon or a group of surgeons, uh, preferably, uh, that are well trained. There is no good excuse now. You would not have a well-trained uh, surgeon. Fellowship of transplantation are all over the place. It takes about two years, really, to maybe three to train a good surgeon and good planning from any government. It should that should be enough. They should, uh, for example, if I take Libya as an example, a country of six million, they probably should have about six well-trained surgeons completed their fellowship. Uh, the well-trained surgeon is going to be needed to help with, uh, do the donor or help with the donor, do the transplant, uh, fix the complications, take care of patients and so on. Not alone, he needs anesthesia. So well-trained anesthesia is very important. Medicine. Oh, that is, there is no doubt about that. So if you have, if you want a successful kidney transplant, you need nephrologists around you. You need immunologists to help you. Uh, you are not going to uh, 
really uh, uh, be able to do kidney transplants alone and you consider yourself successful without nephrologists helping you dealing uh, with the patients and recurrent disease with the workup with the referral of the patients and so on uh, pharmacy is important uh, specialty clinical pharmacists who uh, is well trained in the immunosuppression and their side effects and their interactions together is very important it's needed for your program of course well uh, trained nursing psychologists and social services uh, I cannot elaborate anymore. They are really important and vital part of the team. So you can see now that transplantation is not really as simple as we pronounce it. Transplantation, to do a kidney transplant, you need the help of all these people and facilities. When you make rounds, the same thing, when you make rounds, you should have the input of the social worker, of the pharmacist, of the uh, nurse who is taking care of that patient as the nephrologist and, and the surgeon. So it is by definition, whether you like it or not, it is a multidisciplinary. It is not one man show. Okay. Now we go to the uh, really the real gist of transplantation. So what uh, is needed minimum? You need a donor because if there is no organ there is no transplant. And if there is an organ, then you need a recipient. So if there is a recipient, if there is no recipient, then there is no transplant. So you need an organ and transplant. And of course, there is a lot of things around them with the <coughs> laboratory uh, data, whether it's HLA typing to make sure that the donor is suitable for that uh, particular recipient that the recipient does not have any preformed antibodies and is going to reject that kidney immediately if you transplant it. So the lab, and really a reliable lab, is very important. After the transplant, you need to get a frequent blood work, whether it's kidney function or liver function or uh, whatever uh, needed uh, laboratory results is extremely important and you need a reliable lab. So, uh, uh, in, in addition to, as we mentioned early on, the, the imaging and uh, uh, the uh, CAT scans and MRIs and so on, that's why it is really part of a hospital, cannot be, cannot survive well. It is the wrong idea to have a transplant hospital by itself. So today, out of those, uh, uh, all these things, I'm going to uh, limit the talk to organ donation and we'll we'll uh, we'll talk about the other uh, components uh, one by one uh, so that's why it's going to be a while every week will be one talk about one issue hopefully and each talk will give you a different message so where are the organs are going to come from uh, since we are in 2021 we're still talking really about the human organs uh, research is uh, continuing to uh, maybe one day we'll be able to transplant animal organs and into humans and then we would not be talking about shortage of organs uh, the shortage of organs is really the bottleneck of transplantation and the main problem that we cannot satisfy the need for all these patients who need uh, organs to save their lives, whether kidneys, pancreas, liver, heart, lung, and so on. So, for now, we have two types of organs. Either somebody who died, and those are, we call, we call them deceased or the donors. Uh, before they used them, they call them cadaveric donors, but it's really not used uh, anymore. It's uh, the proper term is deceased donors or somebody is uh, living and going to donate part of their liver or kidney to their loved one. Could be a sister, could be brother, could be father, could be mother, could be friend, and, uh, and so on. Uh, there's a little bit of warning I like to, uh, to mention. It is for you as a student, for you as a general practitioner, for you who, are, who is thinking that 
you may want to start a transplant program or you want to, to start a deceased donor uh, procurement program. Uh, before you start, especially in the Muslim countries, you do need to invest a lot, and invest, I mean it, in the education of the Islamic scholars. You have to convince them. Of course, you have to be well equipped yourself, that you yourself you have to be competent to be able to convince them and answer their questions. Uh, the, uh, the people who lead the Juma prayers, they have to be convinced because these are the people who talk directly to the public and these are the people who uh, the public will listen to them. So if you don't convince them and you just suddenly surprise them with law and starting a transplant program, you may end really ruining the whole thing. You need to invest in the uh, education of the public. And a l part of that public that's really important is available in the education, in the education system, uh, such as universities, high schools, and so on. Uh, you need to educate and uh, discuss and discuss and discuss with your health care workers, with your colleagues in the ICUs, in the neurology, in the neurosurgery. So to make sure that, that you are on the same page and they are convinced that uh, disease donation is really important. It, is, it saves lives and there is no contradiction with the, with the uh, uh, Islamic religious uh, doctrine or, or with the uh, uh, social uh, understanding. So these are really important before you just uh, develop a law and you say, okay, I do have a disease donor program. No, it's, it will not work. And uh, the deceased donors too are really two types too. We have brain dead donors, these are people who were diagnosed uh, as a brain death or people who were not diagnosed as a brain death and they donate after the circulatory death. The, this, this type of donors, we used to call them uh, donation after cardiac death, but it's, again, it is a term is not used anymore, similar to cadaveric uh, death or cadaveric donation is not used anymore. We call it uh, uh, disease donation and so on and deceased donor. So what is brain dead donor? Brain dead is it, it creates really a several, I mean, very specific diagnosis. But before that, uh, let's go over uh, some terminology. So coma. Coma that uh, just the person is still alive and he's still have function is just he doesn't respond for example he will not respond to painful stimuli coma could be from anything could be from car accident uh, other trauma uh, could be induced uh, like uh, hypothermic coma could be as a result of hypoglycemia and there is a, a special uh, scale it's called the glasgow coma scale you can measure how deep the coma is and so on so Coma is not, the person in coma is not uh, suitable for donation, that's still a living person. Vegetative state, that is uh, it's a very difficult uh, diagnosis, but uh, some people uh, call it the post-coma unresponsiveness. And you still have some function, and it requires, the diagnosis requires about three to six months, I think, think in the United States about three months in the same state and in UK is about six months before you allow to make the diagnosis of vegetative state. And then it also is not really uh, suitable for donation. Uh, brain death and that is where we consider the donation. So brain death, what's the brain death? It's a uh, it's really a state of a reversible coma. Uh, it is a state where you have complete cessation, complete loss, complete stop of brain function, including the brainstem. So there is a loss of brainstem function. 
I think I just passed the 15 minutes uh, mark. I will uh, stop here and uh, the next next week uh, video hopefully we'll talk about what's really brain death diagnosis who should make the diagnosis what are the criteria the conditions under which you can make the diagnosis and who is suitable for donation uh, until i see you next week i wish you the best i'm very grateful that you uh, are able to listen to this or part of it I appreciate it even attempting to listen and if you like it and you want to uh, push on the subscribe button, I certainly appreciate that. If you don't, it's okay and have a wonderful week. I'll see you next week.